he just gave this beautiful talk, uh, very inspiring, um, but also very science-driven perspective on a new and exciting field, hand and face transplantation, or what we refer to as vascularized composite uh, mm -hmm. transplantation. From your perspective, from what happened uh, from the early days until today, is VCA a success story? It is. Uh, you know, you look at VCA, uh, both as hand and face, those are the predominant ones that we pay attention to. There were early failures and then progressive, more and more center preparation. And I put center preparation into two categories. One is team preparation to do the actual physical details of the transplant, and the other center preparation in terms of the research that goes behind the transplant that, as you well know, is what truly enables the uh, long-term success of these transplants. And many of the centers now are investing in, in both types of preparation very successfully. So the outcomes I anticipate in the future will be very good. Talking about outcomes, you have elegantly shown how you have prepared with Ed Rodriguez and Rolf Barth to do this one spectacular case that was then performed by your team. How's the patient doing? I talked to him about a week ago, and uh, not only is he doing well from his appearance, his face is completely normal, but some things have happened since I saw him last. His tracheostomy was closed, gastrostomy is closed, and the effect of his, the timber on his voice has completely changed it. He's very easy to understand. He's finished training his tongue now, which was part of the transplant. And uh, his voice is like that of anybody else. And it's uh, really amazing to listen to him. And his attitude is really quite good. He's very, very happy with his new girlfriend. And he's spending time traveling the world talking about uh, what others can experience and how positive the experience was for him. So uh, over the years, his personality has changed, has adopted also, and we understood that in the beginning, it must have been challenging for the patient to go through you know, this obviously life-changing procedure. From your perspective, how has he sort of um, arrived at the point where uh, he's, he's more stable, maybe. Yeah, he, he clearly now has accepted the face as his own, and he realizes that, um, you know, how well he takes care of it and his actions now affect this face. It's not, there's not a uh, artificial line in his mind that, oh, this face belongs to someone else. He has completely embraced it or adopted this new face. Some of us in the field are concerned that long-term outcome might be impacted by the development of, for example, antibodies against the graft or specific mm -hmm. antibodies. Uh, we understand that this is a threat that we only start to understand in kidney and, uh, and also liver transplantation and also pancreas transplantation. Now, in hand transplantation, we have uh, collected the first number of cases where we see antibodies um, appearing late after transplantation. Do you see this as a major threat for this and other patients? And if so, what would be the best strategy to uh, uh, yeah, I think this. you've asked a very important question because many centers, uh, as they've watched renal function slowly deteriorate, have thought that the best choice is to switch from tacrolimus-based therapy to another option, perhaps uh, rapamycin or ivrolimus. And as you know, that has promoted uh, arterial or stenosis in the uh, grafts and creating scenarios for chronic rejection and even antibody. So I think the solutions are going to be much different and based upon using uh, co-stimulation blockade, uh, perhaps de novo or conversion to co-stimulation blockade down the way. But that's certainly how we're going to handle Richard should he be in that situation. Uh, fortunately, he's not at this point. Right. You are aware that the number of patients has been converted to Belatacep because of Oh, the sure. occurrence oh, sure. of antibodies. So that's much in the line of what the field um, right. uh, would think. You have discussed a very interesting option also that might be a solution and maybe a, a mean to prevent development of antibodies and that is vascularized bone marrow, an obviously important element of uh, face transplant. Now, is the understanding of that grown to the degree that you would say this could also be a means to induce 
graft acceptance, um, immunomodulation maybe in solid organ transplantation? Yes, in fact, uh, of one of our uh, current uh, active grants, that is going to be very much uh, the strategy we follow, is using vascularized bone as a means to enhance tolerance to a kidney, for example. And uh, we're trying to figure out now if vascularized bone has much more far-reaching effects than just beyond the transplant itself. So um, to conclude this discussion also, what do you think are the next steps in the field? What's going to happen now? Are we going to see the numbers increasing? Are we going to see different protocols? Are we going to see the numbers declining? No, I think you'll see the numbers increasing. I think I pointed out uh, some of the very practical issues that get in the way of transplant centers proceeding with a uh, face transplant program, and that's having an extraordinary qualified uh, craniofacial surgeon with trauma experience. There are very few of them that have that level of experience and are willing now to m move their career to the kind of commitment where they'll be doing animal work in addition to their burgeoning cancer and trauma work. And it will be my job and the job of some of the centers committed to this to really find the, the next Ed Rodriguez. Thank you, Steve Bartlett, for joining us here today, for coming to Brussels, for giving us this beautiful lecture and for taking time for this interview. It's great to be with you.